All right. Water is getting uh, signed in or whatever on the Kahoot. Do we have any other questions about scheduling or you know, content or anything like that? Yes. Opening what? That, like the book itself. Which book? The two, so, sorry, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> the textbook or the yeah, lab? Materials. Yeah. Um, okay. So these, you don't open them through here. You open them through like their links on campus. This is just to make sure they're opted in. Because if, if, if it said like, so this one's telling you that like the lab, you have access to the lab. So you're opted in, that's good. And you have access to um, the textbook. So you're opted in on that. So that's just telling you that you have access. So that's where you'll go to make sure that you have the access. Okay. But you have to access it through either the McGraw Hill link on the left side or the little link that always says like click here for Top Hat or whatever. Okay. That link you can get to Top Hat. And then you can access after you access it the first time to, to Top Hat. I mean, um, after that, you can access it however you would like. If you want to go to Top Hat site and access it there, or if you want to go um, to their app or anything like that. Um, so it'll be easier after that. But you can always use that link. It's fine. Okay, they take yeah. your classes. Yeah, they are. Yeah. That's kind of the beauty and the curse of online learning. Some people will be like, you know how how hard it is with every uh, class being different. It's like, actually, I don't. Because when I went to class, we didn't have online anything. So yeah, I don't have a, a good concept of that other than what you guys tell me. So uh, yeah, when you guys get confused about it, just come see me. I can tell you on my end. But if we could unify it, it would be great. But just maybe McGraw-Hill's textbook sucks for, I don't know, chemistry. But it, I don't, maybe they don't even have Pearson for microbiology or whatever. So they, they kind of have to be different, unfortunately. The lab manual thing, y'all, I hate Top Hat so much. I've hated it for semesters now. But the, the other option is to have um, like an actual physical lab manual, which also really sucks. Like having to lug that around. And I, they're not small, right? They're not handheld little nice companion. It's a big like three ring binder full of pages. That's what we had in the beginning. So I switched just to digital um, and the top hat is what supports um, what we learn in microbiology. So yes. Attraction. It's not based on any electron sharing at all. It's just based on attraction. Okay. So yeah. So hydrogen. Something that I mean. I feel like it's it's kind of hard a concept to explain if it's not something that they kind of pushed in chemistry for you guys before you came here. But um, whenever hydrogens become polar, they only ever become positive. They're never going to be negative. 
So um, if they are attracting to something, then they have to be a positive. And if they're positive being attracted to something, then the thing they're attracted to has to be negative, always. So that's how you'll know a hydrogen bond is attraction between, it says hydrogen, so it's between a hydrogen and something else. And if you know the hydrogen is positive, then you know something else has to be negative. So let me get that way. Yep, yep, it's all going to be governed by that. Most of the structures of our proteins and our macromolecules and everything like that are going to be governed by that rule, the kind of positive and negative. It just so happens that in a lot of these biological molecules, when we're talking about those charges, we're talking about oxygens and hydrogens, typically. So yeah, that's how it works out that way. Any other questions? Yeah, so that, yeah, um, if we talk about the triglyceride molecules, right, so they're sort of, sort of amphipathic, because they've got the glycerol molecule at the top with all the oxygens and oxygens, right, so they have some sort of polarity, and then they have the long chains of, for the fatty acid portion of it, um, that those guys are hydrophobic, so there is a little bit of amphipathic there, but it's not quite like what you see with the phospholipid, it's like, it's a little more complex. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's definitely gray area, right? There's gray area in all of this. You can be more or less negative or just kind of slightly or, and all of that can dictate how these things interact with one another. That's a good question. Um, but yeah, coming back to Top Hat, I hate it. I know you guys hate it. There's nobody easy that likes it, right? I'm assuming. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking if I can, if I have the time over the break, which I have a lot going on for you guys' classes already over the break, um, believe it or not, uh, if I can, right? pre-lab questions and turn your in-lab, like those things on Canvas, you know, to actually say, hey, go do this though in, in Top Hat. Those things turn them into your pre-lab questions and your actual upload location on Canvas instead of on Top Hat. And that way we have absolutely nothing due on Top Hat. You can do everything on Canvas. All of your due dates will be there on Canvas. And we can just use the Top Hat manual as a reference text for now. Um, I will say if I do it that way, if I have the time, like I said, guys, I'm not sure if I'll have the time, but I will try because I think it'll be easier on all of us to have it that way. But if I have the, the time to do it, number one, I'll make an announcement if that happens. And there will be some leeway. Like if somebody's like, oh, I already completed it on Top Hat, that's fine. I'll just, you let me know and I'll tech, you know, transfer your grade over. If you like Top Hat more, just let me know you're going to use that instead and I'll transfer your grade over. But most people are going to want to use Canvas, I'm quite sure. So um, we'll work those details out if I can get that working. Um, and I'm trying, I think I mentioned before uh, in the lab for you guys that I am working on a lab manual for the lab. That's not going to happen in like over like a weekend. That's not happening over the weekend. It's a whole, like a whole hundred pages, hundreds of pages long layout lab manual. But when I get it together, hopefully that will happen during this time period. And then you won't have to be on top hat at all. Unfortunately, there is absolutely no circumstance where I can refund your money for Top Hat because we are technically, we called it our official text in the beginning and it has a lot more information than my handouts do. That's just the bottom line. So if you needed something to refer to beyond that, that's your text, just like the textbook is for the lecture stuff. So it has a little bit more explanation than what we would get. So we have to leave it that way. Um, but for ease of use, I mean, People haven't liked it in the past, but this semester has been one of those semesters where I feel like it's like the further that we go into relying more and more and more on this digital stuff, the less um, flexible people have been to like the new platforms and how different they might be. And I can't, with Top Hat, it's not flexible enough on my end to make it like do four different days, four different sections and stuff. I have to put all four of my sections into one uh, Top Hat group. So I have a hundred students in there all at once. And so people um, will be like, well, it says on Top Hat that my thing is due at 7.15 PM. So can I just turn it in at 7.15 PM? If you know our lab's at 11.30, I was like, absolutely not. You know, the, <laughs> the syllabus says it's due before your lab. It, the syllabus says it. And I don't know if you guys know this, the syllabus is God as far as you guys are concerned. So <laughs> syllabus says it. And if the, um, also those pre-lab crap on, uh, Canvas where I would be putting your grades and it just represents the, the place where I'll put your grades. Those also say that you have to have it done by before your lab period. Um, so, and that's just imperative that you have it because it's meant to prepare you guys for lab. So I have people being like, oh, um, no, I, it's okay if I turn this in by 7 15 p.m. on Tuesday night. And I was like, no, that's the deadline for my last section. That's why I made it that deadline. 
and I cannot have multiple deadlines on it. It only has one deadline. So you guys are still expected. And it says that I believe somewhere in one of those things has a million things, right? But that you guys um, have to pay attention to the deadlines that are on Canvas, not on Top Hat. And that's why I just don't want to deal with it because um, I can't be going back and forth seeing when people turn their freaking pre-lab in. I don't actually care that much, but at the same time, you do need to be prepared before you come into lab. So I don't want people getting like in the habit of doing it after, you know, because it's for preparing you. So not to mention, um, I can write more controlled questions in Canvas on exactly kind of a more pertinent information um, than what's in Top Hat. You guys don't know yet what I mean by that because you've only really done one exercise, but some of the future ones have some pretty elaborate questions about the content. Um, it's not a bad thing. It's just maybe more than what some people are ready for, for a pre-lab, you know what I mean? So you guys are always welcome, if I change it over, to go back to those pre-labs and fill them out just to check to see your knowledge that's available to you. But I'm probably gonna steer away from that because it's just too much for all of us. For me to have to keep going back and forth and for you guys have to be worrying about, you know, when is this doing, when is that doing? On this class, we do this, and in this other class, we do this, and how am I supposed to keep track? That's kind of why I put the due dates in Canvas, right? So it would remind you that you have to have your pre-lab or whatever turned in by such and such day. But if that's still not, um, you know, making it easy enough for people, that's fine. And I understand. And it would be easier for me if it would auto-populate your grades into Canvas. <laughs> so um, Top Hat has not, does not have that feature at all. So yeah, probably going to try to do that over the weekend. Um, anybody have any complaints about that? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> so there's some stuff we'll talk about in lab as well um, that isn't that kind of stuff, but um, just you know, what we have in time, whatever. We're still figuring things out what'll work best for this um, semester. It's weird, I hate to say it like this, but if you ask any professor, every semester is so different from like whatever group of students that you get, somehow the dynamics of the students make quite a difference in how you're teaching your semester that semester as opposed to the previous one. And the stuff I did in the spring just isn't like driving as well as you guys, but that's fine. I'll accommodate that. But I just am letting you know that I have to get kind of prepared for it first. So no problem. I just want to give you guys a heads up. I always do the opposite lighting. Yeah, they don't have a nucleus. Does that mean they can't contain DNA? All right. So this one trips a lot of people up. We don't have a nucleus, um, and yet a nucleus is an organelle, basically. We'll talk about what those are today. That's what chapter five is about. But it's a structure that is membrane bound that contains all of the genetic information uh, in a cell. If you are a cell, any kind of cell, remember we had talked about there are the eukaryotes and the akaryotes. The akaryotes include bacteria and archaea. So those are our three cells, basically, cell groups. All three of them have DNA as their genetic information, always. Everybody can do that. So <laughs> So in some form, yes, but when we talk about viruses, you can you can kind of do these single-stranded RNAs in certain formats in cells. They tend not to have just straight up single-strand RNA as far as aside from what they use for like messenger RNA or something like that. There are our genetic material will never be anything but DNA. And that's gonna be, you know, double-stranded helix and all of that. When we get into the viruses, they are going to have the option they can have a genetic material of RNA. That they're not cells though, are they? So, and if it's a cell, DNA, okay? So just think of it that way. The difference is that in a eukaryotic cell like us, we contain our genetic material inside of a nucleus. Um, the bacteria, they have their DNA just chilling out in the cell and it tends to congregate in an area called the nucleoid region, but it's not contained by anything. So. Yeah, it can still have DNA. So that's the concept there. I kind of like that question because I feel like that's one of those that clears up a little bit of gray area you didn't even know was there. 
Okay, the peptidoglycan layer is blank in gram positive bacteria compared to gram negative bacteria. Yeah, so the gram positive means positive because it's positive for that thick peptidoglycan layer. Peptidoglycan positive, I guess that helps me remember it, but whatever. So, yeah, good job. Right, the gram negative outer membrane contains which of the following? Read your choices. All right. So this, this question is the type of question that I consider to be kind of like the more simple level questions of what you're going to see on the exam. I'm not going to give you choices of endotoxin and house and dog and yellow. That's not going to be it ever. So it's always going to be other terms that either are science related or even directly relate, like some of these do, to bacteria in general. But you have to know which one is found in the gram negative outer membrane. So I know it's still new, no biggie, but that is the endotoxin. It's endo because it's part of the gram negative in the outer membrane, but it's a toxin to us. Lycotechoic, remember that one is going to be on the gram positives. It supports their so while exotoxins are secreted out by any kinds of bacteria, it doesn't have to be gram negatives. That has nothing to do with the outer membrane. And then lysozyme is just an enzyme that breaks down peptidoglycan. It's made by our cells. So breaks it down, helps us defend against bacteria. And then your sweat and your tears and stuff. All right, what is acid fast staining? In chapter three, we introduced this concept, and then in chapter four, we kind of took it down to the details. And then the lab and lab four, we'll actually put this into application. Okay, so acid fast staining. Um, it, what the term acid fast is referring to is that even in the present, uh, even in the presence of acid being applied to your slide once you make it, your sample is still going to hold fast to the stain. And why is it holding fast to the stain in the presence of acid? Because the stain that you used was a lipid soluble stain that bound to the waxiness of mycolic acid. So you just do have to know here that mycolic acid was that waxy coating, like what we see in mycobacterium. So that's what's going on with that. The stuff on the outside of theirs. They're not, um, they're like deviants from the gram positives. And mycoplasma, which is a different thing, is an acid fast positive organism with a thick waxy cell wall. Is that true? Remember, there's two mycos. So this one is false. So we have the mycobacterium and the mycoplasma. Those are the only two mycos that you have to remember in this course for the entire course, the mycos, okay? Mycobacterium and mycoplasma. Yeah, later on, we're going to talk about diseases that might be caused by mycobacterium this and mycobacterium that and mycoplasma this. But for the big genera groups, mycobacterium, mycoplasma. If you can just keep those two in your little lineup of things to remember, plasma, remember, doesn't have a shape. Why doesn't it? When you pour it out, if you have a literal cup of plasma, if you pour it out, it doesn't keep a shape, right? Because it's liquid. So why doesn't it keep a shape if it were a cell? because it doesn't have a cell wall to maintain its shape. So it does not have a cell wall at all. So it cannot have a thick waxy cell wall. So those are our defining characteristics. Plasma, no shape, no cell wall versus the bacterium, the mycobacterium, they have the mycolic acid that's on their cell wall, their thick cell wall, the waxy coating, okay? I know it's a lot. A lot of stuff that at this point people are like, yeah, we're almost on vacation and I just cannot be bothered to give a shit. And I understand that. So that's okay. What are bacilli? So you get a million hours to answer this one, apparently. It's two minutes, but still. Feels like an eternity. So in case you guys don't don't know, that's a quad street plate. Hmm. How are we doing those today in lab? Yep. 
Y'all aren't gonna make me wait out this whole two minutes, are you? <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, thank you. Um, the rod shape back here, that's exactly right. So the bacilli, your two big daddies for the shapes are the cocci and the bacilli. If you remember anything for the cell shapes, just at least remember those two. So they will come up often. And in fact, whenever we look at your cells on when you come back Thursday, um, from what you're streaking today, we're gonna look at them on Thursday, right? And you're gonna have to tell me if they're cocci or bacilli. So, and then when we're going forward from that, if you're looking at what you thought was your gram positive that you thought had cocci, and then one day suddenly now you're looking at bacilli, then you know there's a problem there somewhere. Either you mixed up your slides or you picked up the wrong sample or there's contamination or something. So things like that can even keep you on track in lab as well. Because, hey, these are living things and they're on living like a, a surface that helps things live. So other things can also want to live there too. So we want to keep track of all of that stuff. Um, I am not the one that is responsible for keeping your cultures clean and contamination free, right? That's part of your job with aseptic technique. Um, of course, if you find contamination, I'll help you make a clean culture, but um, it's your responsibility to keep them clean for the entire semester. So keep that in mind. Um, so when you're looking at them, you'll get used to seeing your cells and what they're supposed to look like once we get familiar with them when we get back. So yeah, bacilli, rods, cocci, round cells, and they're pretty distinctive typically, and they will be absolutely be distinctive compared on the lab exam. What does peritrichus mean? Okay, so this is in fact the flagella being distributed over the entire cell. Be sure that you know the other terms for the flagellar arrangements because this is, again, one of those types of questions. So this is pretty typical of what you might see for a question on an exam, right? Kind of what I was saying, there's a term here and there's gonna be definitions that could apply to anything with flagella. So that's likely what you'll see. Sometimes I get lazy and I'll add a choice in there that will like completely be a freebie as long as you have been paying attention at all. Like you should just be, aware of it, but not usually. So um, obviously like here, this is the easy knockout. It should be, right? Uh, cell lacking flagella. If you haven't been studying at all, you might still include that in your possibilities. But most people, if they've been paying attention, they know I remember learning about this being an arrangement. So it's not that, one. it's not yellow. So that's a, that's a thing as well. Studying helps. <laughs> so we have um, all over and so be aware of what the other three terms were. I'm not gonna go over them right now and what their definitions are so you know the difference between them and which one is what definition because I give you the opposite question. All right, bacterial capsules, what do they do? So bacterial capsules are pretty classically known as uh, sticky co coatings, easy enough. And um, that sticky coating is often used for adhesion, creating biofilms, things like that. But the other thing that we need to know of, other than adhesion, is going to be it protects against phagocytosis. So phago eating, um, cyto by the cells, so our cells going up and eating them. They can get away eat more easily with that. Good job, guys. You did really good with that one. When are endospores produced? Okay, so they're going to be produced in those nutrient deficient conditions. So think of that endospore, like I said, endo does mean that we're forming it inside of a bacterial you know, shell that sporangium, but also think of it as if you were um, an endospore being called an endospore, endo to you sort of sounds like inside, so you're like curling in inside of yourself to hunker down, like we had said, duck and cover or something like that. Um, so that, um, they're only gonna be hunkering down when, you know, shit's going south. They're not gonna be doing that when things are good. So they're not gonna do it for a means of replication because that things will be good you are replicating. You don't replicate your cells in a bad situation, right? Um, warm conditions, most of us know that's a pretty happy situation for most bacteria. 
Yeah, you're not going to have too much. That's the only bad situation. Where you would want to hunker down and wait it out. All right, how would you describe the strepto arrangement? All right, so structo, the chains, like I said, I remember a strip, a strip of cells or a chain of cells. Good job. Uh, again, if you're talking about arrangements, the big one to be aware of, structo and staphylo. Palisades, if you want to, I think they kind of describe themselves because they're so separate from the others. Palisades are for the bacilli, the fence-like arrangement, right? But structo and staphylo, be sure you understand those words from one another. All right, here's a little pose. Even though I know we are talking about eukaryotes today, we're going to come back to this. Okay. So there's some stuff that eukaryotes do that we'll need to clarify there. But good job, everybody. Oh, pay attention where my mouse is when I do that. Okay, so for the eukaryotes. So first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about endosteos. Swallowed up a bacteria and then found, okay. Um, and then found some uh, benefit having the bacteria in there. So the bacteria was giving it energy. And when it provided nutrients to the bacteria, you know, it would keep making that energy. So they were both happy, bacteria getting nutrients, the cell getting energy from it. And then that was uh, what we call a symbiotic relationship. They're working together. And in time, eventually become dependent on it. And then that cell that it swallowed up may have become the mitochondria. That's the concept. We're gonna come to uh, the details of how, why we think that in later slides, because I feel like it brings it up a lot and I just don't wanna bring it up right now. Okay. Let's go. Right. So with eukaryotes, um, there are some organelles or structures in the cells that all eukaryotes always have, and that's the one ones on the list on the left. The ones on the list on the right are kind of the optional ones. So those are the ones that not all of them are going to have. Things like a cell wall. This should be obvious. We know that plant cells, which are eukaryotic, right? We know they have a cell wall. And we know that our cells, which are eukaryotic, do not have a cell wall. So obviously that one's optional, okay? Locomotor appendages. That one I feel like also should be kind of obvious. So here we're talking about things like the flagellum for the bacteria. Bacteria have flagella, eukaryotes have some other options, okay? But do our skin cells move around and have locomotion? No, they don't need to. So that's a eukaryotic cell that doesn't need it. But if we're talking about something like Giardia lamblia, that's like a protozoa that swims around in water and stuff, or amoebas or whatever. They need to be able to move around. So of course that's optional. So locomotion in general. And then the chloroplasts. I don't think I need to say anything about that, right? So photosynthesis, we don't need it in our cells, but plants do. That's an example. So those guys are optional ones. Everything else, everybody's got to have. Okay, so this is a diagram. This one isn't as nice as the bacterial one because it doesn't have the descriptions. So it might be a good diagram to come back to when you're studying to see if you remember what each one of these structures does. But anyways, let's start with the flagella. And yes, I did just say flagella. 
uh, for bacteria, these are flagella for the eukaryotes. So flagella for eukaryotes are quite different. They are thicker, like 10 times thicker, they are more complex. They actually have an extension of the cell membrane. So in the bacteria, they had theirs um, where they had their little motor going through. And then the flagella was like a guy attached to it and it would rotate around like that. Um, and that's how it worked on the bacteria, right? Well, eukaryotic cells, when they have flagella, it doesn't work like that. Theirs is sort of, well, quite a bit more complicated. So instead of having this situation where um, you would have the cell membrane and something sticking kind of embedded in it. What they have is an extension of it all the way around. It'd be much longer than this, but hey, you get the idea. It's like a big, long tail. And the membrane's actually literally going around the whole structure of the flagellum. And this guy has a whole like mess of stuff stabilizing this. It's more than I can draw in here, obviously, but they have stuff inside to help stabilize it. It's not just a like, protein being spun around by a motor. Because of how this is shaped, and this is this stuff that's on the inside is uh, microtubules, and it's arranged in a nine plus two. I'm about to show a picture of that. But this allows it to move in a whipping motion, and it is a controlled whipping motion, so much more controlled than how the bacteria were doing, but they're just switching, rotating this way or rotating that way. So now we can actually move our flagellum like a, a tail, like a controlled movement of a tail to help us get around. Um, so here's our picture of our nine plus two arrangement. And I'm not gonna test you over this, but I just think it's um, nice to look at this and see that how it's arranged. These are just microtubules, little uh, protein structures throughout the inside of that membrane that are providing the stability to the flagellum. That's a cross section of the flagellum. Pretty cool looking stuff. So nine pairs around the outside and then two right in the middle. Neat. Okay, so they have flagella. Cool. So eukaryotic cells, if they're locomotor, could have flagella to be uh, flagella to be able to get around. They also could have cilia. So now we're deviating completely from the bacteria, right? They could only have their flagellum, their little motor flagellum. Now we can have our whip flagellum, or some cells have cilia. This is mostly going to be found in protozoa. They'll have like their little oar-like, tiny little hairs that are oar-like, but some animal cells also have cilia involved in them. Um, like if we're talking about uh, in your lungs, whenever you uh, have like mucus and your body's trying to get out, things out of your body, you inhale debris or whatever, all the time this is happening, right? Just doesn't happen when you're sick. But um, they're always moving the mucus out of your lungs and that cilia on your lungs, on, on the inside of your lungs, your lung epithelium are what's helping uh, get debris out of your lungs. And when you cough, it helps that uh, move. So, um, yeah, so that's an example where you would see cilia where we're not actually moving our cells themselves, but we're moving the environment around us to help you know, with their function. So. so that can be moving the cells or it can be moving the environment around it. You can also use it for feeding. Okay, so those are the two structures that are used for locomotion. We'll come back to another version of locomotion later on when we get into the protozoa. So the glycocalyx, we talked about glycocalyx and bacteria, they have capsules or slime layers. Turns out that eukaryotic cells can also have capsules or slime layers, uh, quite similar actually. But also if you're a eukaryotic cell, you have an extracellular matrix. That's your other option, right? And if you guys have taken, um, I don't know if you did in anatomy, probably at least teach it in physiology about the extracellular matrix. This is like the molecules outside of the cells themselves. They aren't cells. It's just a network of sugars and proteins that create a fiber-like network for your cells to attach to one another or to delineate your organs from one another, um, compartmentalize things and all of that. So that's the extracellular matrix. That's your glycocalyx, okay? Why do your skin cells stick together? S cells just don't naturally, just normally stick together. Part of that is proteins interacting with each other and also this extracellular matrix. Uh, the cell wall, again, not everybody has one. Obviously, plants have a cell wall. We're not talking really about plants in this microbiology because they aren't microbes. But other guys that have cell walls are the fungi and the algae. Algae have cellulose like plants do. And then um, the fungi have chitin or cellulose, but they can have chitin is what I'm trying to say. It's a different thing that they can have. Um, you guys haven't heard about chitin. It's also what can make up the exoskeleton of bugs. So it's kind of interesting that that could be similar. 
All right, cytoplasmic membrane. This is a common concept that we know all cells have a cytoplasmic membrane. Cytoplasmic membrane is a fancy word for the membrane that's going to be just enclosing everything in the cell. The main big bag membrane you might have stuff going on like walls and stuff outside of it, but everybody has a cytoplasmic membrane. Um, and we know it's a, it's a lipid bilayer. It's not really anything crazy. All right, we have the, let's get into the organelles, the nucleus. When we get into the genetic stuff in chapter six, the idea of the nucleus and how it functions and what it's doing for the cell is going to be key. But for now, you just need to understand the concept of what it is and why it's there. So the nucleus is an organelle. It is membrane bound. And when I say something is membrane bound, I do mean it has a lipid bilayer, so that one membrane, but it's made up of those phospholipids and um, how they orient in the lipid bilayer. So that's always what I'm going to be talking about with membranes. <clears throat> so it's a similar, um, got a membrane around it, and that is called the nuclear envelope, that membrane that it has around it. The nucleus is the organelle that contains all of your genetic information. So for us, all of our chromosomes are in there, um, and then so the, the 20 pairs or whatever, uh, hanging out in there, and then um, they're hanging out in there. Instead of, in for bacteria, a big, single, big old circle for their chromosome, just hanging out in the cytoplasm. Now we have all of our different chromosomes hanging out in the nucleus. This helps us keep it contained. Clearly, when I'm telling you that we are having all these multiple chromosomes that are hanging out in here, we need to keep control of this as far as compared to like where the rest of the cell is and how the function of the rest of the cell is going to go. Because we have way more going on in the eukaryotic cell. So that's why we have these compartments. Okay. Um, so inside of the nucleus is your genetic information. And it doesn't just sit there. And your genetic, I want to be clear, your genetic information, your DNA is never leaving the nucleus ever. The only time that it's not in a nucleus is when that nuclear envelope is dissolved to make new cells. And that's because we're going to make copies of our DNA and then we're going to separate them into new cells in mitosis, which we're going to talk about this in a minute. But um, yeah, so that's the only time it's not in a nucleus is when we're making a new cell. However, every other time in your cells right now, they are inside of your nucleus. Even if your cell needs to make a protein to do this or a protein to do that, or I need the protein that's going to help me break down lactose, or I need a protein that's going to do this, and I don't have that already, so we need to start making it, and I'll get signals from the cell telling it to do that. Well, it has to cross the nuclear envelope in order to signal for the DNA to start doing that. And how does it do that? It stays in the nuclear envelope. It never, ever leaves the nucleus. So the reason that we have those hydrogen bonds holding our ladder together, like we talked about the A's and the T's and whatever, the reason it's hydrogen bonds and weak bonds like that is because any time that you need to go um, make a new protein of any kind, which your body is constantly doing all the time. If you're alive, it's doing it. If you're doing things, every single gene in your body codes for a protein. It doesn't code for anything else, nothing else. If you're like, well, what about if I need lipids and whatever, then they make a protein that will make lipids. That's what your genes code for. So always a protein. The only other genes in your body will help regulate the production of those proteins. That's it. So, so much of your existence, your movements, your thoughts, anything, if you are sending chemical signals from one thing to another, somewhere or somehow there's a protein involved in controlling all of that. So you always have to have proteins being made by your nucleus. And some cells are going to have more than others, and some cells make some things and not other things, and that's what makes the cells different. But if you're going in there to make your proteins and you're always needing to make proteins, then you need to be able to access the DNA. And the DNA has all of your instructions that you can go into, and you will make a copy of the gene that you're interested in. You want the protein that helps you, you know, make a specific amino acid, let's say a spartate. You need to make more aspartate because you're making this kind of protein over here. There's other proteins. You might be making amino acids with a protein to make more proteins. <laughs> but yeah, you need this thing to help you make aspartate. So you go to the DNA and you say, here's the gene for making aspartate, the protein that does that. And I want um, to build that. So we'll just make a copy of that one, just that one. And then that copy can leave the nucleus. But what I'm talking about here is what we're getting into in chapter six. But I feel like in, in, you know, understanding the nucleus and that function of it helps understand a whole like playthrough of everything that a eukaryotic cell does. So think of it as I like to call it like the Smithsonian Institution. 
That's what the nucleus is, all right? The Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institution. If you wanted to go in there and find some compendium, big old book that has instructions for everything, um, you know, whatever, but it can't leave the Smithsonian, right? You're not gonna take that. If you need to make one protein out of there, out of you know, 20,000 genes, you're not gonna take that whole big book and be like, borrowing this real quick and like <laughs> leave and go make your protein and then bring it back. That's nuts, right? You're not taking all of the genetic material. You're not taking that one compendium out of the Smithsonian Institution. You're coming in there, you're opening it to your protein that you want, copying down the instructions for that, and then taking that home. That copy that you just made is RNA, messenger RNA. So you've probably heard of it. So it is carrying the message for that gene, that protein. So that's all that messenger RNA does. So that's why we have to have those hydrogen bonds in the DNA that we talked about. So we can open that up frequently. And it can't cost us too much energy to access these genes because we're going to need to access them all the time. So that's why hydrogen bonds, it makes sense. So also using hydrogen bonds to make our messenger RNA when we're making our copy. We're just making like, if it says AT or whatever, it would be like TA and then making the copy on your messenger RNA. Then it takes that, which is just from DNA. Now we've made a single RNA of that one gene messenger that we can take out of the nucleus. And that's what we'll work with next in our next structure. I don't want to get into that now because now we get to talk about mitosis and meiosis. So we've got all those genes in there, our big old compendium inside of a Smithsonian institution. What happens if we make a new cell? Anytime that you fall and scrape your knee and you need to heal, you need new cells. If you're a little tiny baby and you need to grow into an adult, you need to make copies of your cells, exact copies, right? They all need to have the exact same information in them so that everything is there um, if we ever need to make a protein. So they all need an exact copy of what we have in your cells, Smithsonian Institution. So how are we gonna make a copy of that? Well, that's gonna be DNA replication that we'll be talking about in um, chapter six. But once you've made your copy, and you've got your two copies, and you're getting ready to have your two new cells. This is mitosis. Um, you only need to know four steps in my class. Okay, I know there's like a bunch of things up here, but here are the four steps that you need to know. P, M, A, T. Now, Dr. Shearer would tell you, he tells the students to remember it as like it says PMAT, so take your puppy to pee on the mat, if you can remember, okay? That's how I remember it as well. And so uh, that's PMAT, and that's how you can remember the order of it. Here's what happens in each one. P is prophase. It's basically the preparation phase, the prep phase. So we're getting ready for stuff. So you'll see in this image here, this is prophase, that we have the development Look at those nice happy X's that are nice and clear and they look like this sort of and they're kind of, you know, hanging out like that now. Whereas it was just DNA just chilling out in the open, right? When we made a big old copy of our DNA, it was like a big old mess and another big old mess inside of the nucleus. But then we are going to bring it in and uh, tighten it up into basically chromatin is what we call it. Okay? And those chromosomes will then look like X's because your chromosomes, listen to me, do not look like X's, okay? No, nope, 100% no, okay? You've been lied to. <laughs> this is when I'm drawing and leaving on the board, you're like, yeah, but you just drew it. And that's what everybody's, you're, no. They only look like this during mitosis. Why? Because if you have a chromosome that is one single linear chromosome and you need to make a new cell, what do you have to do with that chromosome? Make a copy of it. I mean, that's sort of self-explanatory. And then they are joined at the middle. And we're about to tear them apart, okay? That's the only time they look like X's. Naturally, in your cell, normally they're just one line. So don't forget that, right? The only time we can see your chromosomes clearly, like with imaging, without having to be like um, getting, you know, super detailed about genetics and all of this, you can actually see your chromosomes during mitosis only during this because of those you know, um, consolidated X's. So that's why you always see them in the picture as lined up as X's because you'll have one X from your mom and one X from your dad and that's that. Well, you actually have one chromosome from your mom and one chromosome from your dad and they're both been copied. Because if you have one chromosome from your mom, let's say, well, let me erase this one. I bring my jack janky tablet because I knew it would work in here. Um, you have one from your mom, we'll just put an M here for your mother. And you know what I mean by this. 
um, I mean, genetically speaking, okay? Uh, and then one from the father. And then they have to make, they both are considered chromosome one, right? And you have one from mom, one from dad. That's why you have two of each, you have pairs of each from one from mom, one from dad. They're both going to go be through mitosis. So they both have to go make X's. And then your new cell also has to wind up with one from mom and one from dad. So one cell will have that. Sorry, excuse me, that's not right at all. I'm trying to circle these like individually, but that'll be meiosis, but I don't want to talk about that round. One from mom and one from dad. So if this was your original cell, then your new cell has to look like that. And then your old, uh, other new cell will have to look like that. So have two cells in the end. So they have to have the same number of chromosomes as they started with. So we go from having the 23 pairs to making 23 pairs that have doubled and attached to one another in the X's. And now we're going to tear them apart so that we have back two singles. Make sense? Yes. So if you have um, an X or a left, that's when you, that's when you have the form. Yes. So having um, an extra chromosome or less of a chromosome can cause uh, issues with your body being able to like be able to produce certain proteins correctly or making too much of a protein or whatever, because this balance exists for a reason. Um, and your body is basically programmed everything about your body is programmed to deal with the correct number of chromosomes. So whenever you deviate from that, it can be quite serious in our biology, sometimes even deadly depending on the disease that we're talking about. Sometimes it just causes some deformities, but it, um, yeah. So it can be an issue, but uh, so it's even more of an issue when we're talking about meiosis, which is making our um, sex cells. But let's continue with mitosis for a moment. That's our prep. That is uh, the P. We're just getting everything ready. The next one is metaphase. That's this one here, metaphase. This was prophase. And metaphase. And it is, consider it, I like the word middle. Why? Because this is metaphase, look at it. Look at our chromosomes. They're lined up straight up and down, down the middle. Or that's how it would look like in a cell as well. So uh, metaphase lining up in the middle. You can see what it's getting ready to do because you can watch the pictures. Um, the next one is anaphase. And this one is going to be A for a part. B for prep, M for middle, A for a part. Um, but yeah, here's that picture of that. So here at this point, we are using spindle fibers and centrioles, which I don't need to be aware of, but just the concept of each step is more important to me, using structures in the cell to pull those chromosomes, physically pull them apart. So now the copies that you had of moms, um, or the two copies that should be exactly identical, get pulled apart so we can now work on separating cells and they'll have the exact same genetic information. So this all happens all at once um, in mitosis, all of this will go through each step. But that's anaphase. And then telophase, luckily, if you remember PMAT, you'll just know that it's the end. So what would have to happen at the end? Finishing up and making the new cells, um, all that. So we're going to be dividing up and all of this. So telophase, look at this. We're reforming our nuclear envelope. We are uh, getting ready to divide our cells, tensing them off the membrane and all of this. So a bunch of stuff is going on, more than I'm explaining to you in these steps, of course. But as long as you can get the idea of what's generally happening in each one, telophase, I couldn't think of anything better when I was thinking of this. I think always think of like totally done. But if you have a better word, use that. <laughs> but I feel like this kind of helps you understand what's happening in each one. So that remember, you're always going to have your um, multiple choice on the test. I'm not going to have you like tell me all of what PMAT is. What does each word letter mean and what happens in each one off of your mind? It's always going to be, you know, here is a word and pick what its definition is or put that into practice somehow. So you'll always have a choice. So as long as you can break it apart somehow that you understand it, that's what's important for the exams, right? Um, so, yeah. All right. Then meiosis. So <laughs> if I'm telling you that mitosis will lead to, you know, uh, the same number of chromosomes in there. And that makes sense if you're making new cells to like heal or grow or whatever. But if you're trying to make sex cells, that would be a problem. So let's imagine this. If you have the number of chromosomes that you're supposed to have in one whole cell, and then you have another cell coming with it that has the number of chromosomes in one whole cell, and they come together, 
how many chromosomes do you suddenly have now? Double. And that would happen every time. So if that double comes with another double, double, that even, and so forth, so on and so forth. That is not how sex works. We know that because you know sperm is going to come together with an egg and they're going to have normal chromosomes count typically when they come together. So how are they cutting it back from that? Well, we know already we've divided this up. You have one chromosome from your mother and one from your father for every chromosome in your cell, in all cells, right? That's her normal makeup. So when we go through meiosis to make your sex cells, you get in your sex cells when they divide one more time from this. So we're going to separate the mother from the father one. So you're not going to have two for each chromosome type, not 23 pairs, but 23 individual. So that's how they're going to separate it out. And how does that happen? Well, it's a very complicated process when we're going through meiosis to actually get our sex cells because we aren't just separating them the mother and the father, we're actually going to have crossing over events happening where we're going to switch up the genetic material to get genetic variability. So that way we aren't just, you know, have variability in our genes. That helps with us getting new traits and all that. Um, so it's a little more complicated than that. And then you will have um, half the number that you need, so just 20, well, 23 singles in your um, sex cells and then 23 singles in your partner's sex cells so they can come together to make the 23 doubles. The mother and the father, that's where it comes from. All right, so they get 23 pairs in the new baby that results. That's how meiosis works and why it works the way that it does. I mean, so you don't need to know any more about it than that. All right, moving on. So uh, back to that nucleus that we were talking about, the our Smithsonian Institution, where our compendium of stuff is that can never leave, and we need to make a copy of it to get it out, to work with it, to make a protein. Turns out, whenever you're coming in there to copy out your gene onto your messenger RNA to take it out, to start making it, the place you're taking it is the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the structure in the cell where we're gonna make proteins and other molecules. And the way that proteins are made is using these machines called ribosomes. They also are made of RNA. And when we introduced our nucleus, see here where it's talking about nucleolus, blah, 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 that I didn't bring it up. That's just an area where ribosomal RNA is being made. You have to make so much protein all the time that you need ribosomes like mad. So there is an area in your nucleus where it's focusing solely on making ribosomal RNA full ribosomes and it stains differently. And it's called the nucleolus. That's all it is. It's not a structure, it's just an area. Okay. All right. But anyway, so we make our messenger and we take it into the endoplasmic reticulum, specifically into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It is rough because it's studied with those ribosomes, those little machines that are going to read your message and translate it. Now we can see how DNA to RNA, it's the same message, but if you're coming into your Smithsonian, it's all typed out nice and clean, and then you're writing it out, maybe this is in the language of DNA. And then when you're writing it out roughly to make a copy, that's your RNA. Still the same language, but DNA versus RNA. They're a little different. Still nucleic acids. But now we're going to convert nucleic acid into protein. That's a different language entirely. So now we're going to take nucleic acid and turn it into amino acids and then uh, sequence those to make a whole protein. And that's what the ribosome does for us. It's going to translate that message. That's called translation, literally. So again, that's chapter six, but I feel like it makes sense to understand some of this while we're working through this. We're going to do that in the rough ER. The ribosomes are the machines that are going to be reading your message. So they, it makes it look rough on the surface of the ER. This happens on the membrane. So it looks like it's studded with these little guys. And then the smooth part of the ER is going to be the part where we're not doing proteins. We're doing just other things like lipids or whatever, modifying your protein, all that. So if you're making proteins, it's rough because of ribosomes. Ribosomes also exist in the cytoplasm, by the way. They don't have to be associated with the ER. But that is a primary function of what's going to be where our proteins are going to be going on. So cool, that's what it looks like. Look at that. It always exists around the nucleus. And that makes sense because if you're taking your message out of the nucleus and you need to work on it right away in the ER, you want your ER right up against your nucleus. So it always surrounds the nucleus. Look at all those folds in it. All right. Next is the Golgi apparatus, probably the most vague of all of the structures in the eukaryotic cell. Uh, it is involved in packaging and transporting. So if you would say there are uh, people that are actually making the things that are going in your Amazon box, 
in the in the ER. Now they are uh, gathering all the stuff that they just made from Amazon, and they're telling the Golgi apparatus to be the warehouse guys that are going to package it into the right boxes to get sent to the right places. That's what the Golgi does. It's not anything super mysterious, just packaging and transport. And it's super important because it's going to create vesicles inside of the cell, as well as help you excrete things from the cell or move things in the cell. But those vesicles in the cell that can hold onto um, things for later use, whether that is for signaling or whether that is for degrading bad guys that you just ate up. But it does all that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we know it's sort of an assembly line. This is kind of how it would work the nucleus, um, and then into the ER, and then into the Golgi, and then either out of the cell or wherever. Um, there's the, some vesicles that can be made by the Golgi, like the lysosome. Go figure that it contains lysozyme. Like I said earlier, lysozyme is an enzyme that's going to break down peptidoglycan, and it can have other toxic enzymes. We will take lysosomes. Zome just always feel like it is a vesicle, okay? It just generally means that. So those lysosomes, and lys means to break down, will uh, merge. You eat up your bacteria. So this is your bacteria here, and you eat it up, and you create a little vesicle around it all in its own. It's called a phagosome. That tracks, right? So it's in this little phagosome, and you're going to take your lysosome with all your toxic compounds and merge them together in the cell, and that will break it down. So all those chemicals will break it down. That's how your cell will kill bad guys. Um, so it's not as simple as just eating it. What happens after you eat it? <laughs> that, okay? Uh, so that's the idea of the purpose of the lysosomes. And vacuoles are going to be storage for pretty much anything. We know vacuoles in plants uh, containing water, they provide rigidity as well to the cells. And those vacuoles, um, if you aren't watering your plants well enough, that's why your plants wilt, because your vacuoles of your cells in your plant are not full of water anymore. All right, next is the mitochondria. We know this is the energy generator of the cell. They have uh, basically made up of the structure of Christae in the matrix. I don't really want to talk about it without going into the picture. Let's go to this picture of it. So it has an outer membrane all around it, and it has these this inner membrane. And you see how there's like the folds in there? Those folds are creating surface area for our production of energy. And this is going to be in the process of aerobic respiration, which we'll learn about in chapter 10, the process of it. But that's where that where that's all happening. And so the matrix is what's inside of all of that. And um, then all that's happening on the actual um, folds of the cristae. And that's how you make energy in your cells. So it's pretty cool. That's your machinery that does that. Um, they have ribosomes all of their own. So they don't, they don't, they have ribosomes of their own. Why would they need ribosomes of their own? Because they have DNA of their own. Why do they have DNA of their own? They have a nice single circular chromosome, your mitochondria do, and their own ribosomes that look like bacterial ribosomes, not like ours. And they have two membranes. Hey, they're just folded up weird. And I mean, they also divide on their own and they divide by binary fission, not by mitosis. Binary fission is what bacteria will do. So tell me that isn't compelling evidence that that used to be a bacteria back in the distant day. Um, your genes, there's no gene in your body whatsoever that codes for a mitochondria. All the other ones in your body get their genes, but not mitochondria. You guys know where your mitochondria come from? From your mother? You ever wonder why the egg is so much bigger than the sperm? It's got to carry mitochondria with it. Think about that. So you don't code for your mitochondria. Your mom didn't either. It's just been mitochondria passed on from generation to generation to generation. Everybody's mitochondria came from their mother's side of things. That is pretty crazy to think about. And yes, there's genetic variability just because they have to divide on their own and it's not always genetically maintained. So they have their own genetic um, you know, material that we can go back way far back in time and compare everybody, all species ever that ever had a mitochondria and look at the differences in their DNA to compare it. And that's pretty impressive. So mitochondria, that's cool. Turns out chloroplasts, same freaking thing, y'all. It's just a different structure. So these are like mitochondria, but these are using the sun to generate energy. So they have chlorophyll or other pigments that get excited by the sun, and then they use that to make energy. But their structure, of course, looks a little different. They, those little guys that are uh, stacked up, 
They have their membrane. So that's our second membrane. They have their own ribosomes. They have their own chromosomes. They have all of that. So these guys are quite similar to the mitochondria in that respect. So those, that's what we are talking about with the endosymbiotic theory, okay? Pretty impressive. All right, we already talked about ribosomes. You don't need me to talk about it. Yes, it talks about the sizes of the ribosomes. I hate talking about the sizes of the ribosomes outside of the fact that this organism is different from the other one. That's as much information as I need. But yes, some have full size ribosomes. It's 80S. For bacteria, it's 70S. I'm not ever going to test you on that, but it's based on, like, um, if you're interested, because somebody asked me in my last class, how did it, like, what that means, the S. It's like a weight uh, density measurement. So they will take like a gradient of glucose. It's like thick glucose versus light glucose. It's literally just diluted. And then spin it in an ultra centrifuge. If you guys don't know ultra centrifuge, we're talking like crazy high speeds. It's not like a desktop little nice centrifuge that spins something. We're talking about a massive piece of equipment that you could get like two tubes inside because it's such a big mess going on with how to make things spin so fast. Anyways, it spins so fast. And then it causes things to settle where their density is, how dense they are at the density of that glucose that matches them. So that's how they got these numbers. It's just density of where it settles, if you're interested. That is what it feels like to be a graduate student. Okay. <laughs> I don't care at all for our I think they're, they're really just terrifying. Um, they're like a death machine, like death trap just waiting to happen. Okay, uh, cytoskeleton, um, this is just what's supporting everything in your cell, giving it some structure as well as uh, structure, I say it like highways to like move things on. And if you need to move something from one area of the cell to another, guess what you need to be using? Proteins, proteins are gonna be moving. If you've ever seen the little video of like the little guy walking along, the little uh, fiber or whatever, carrying a big old vesicle, the little guy that's walking along is protein. He had to come from the Smithsonian Institution at some point. So anytime you're moving anything in the cell, anytime that you're doing anything for the cell, you need your genes for it. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Trying to decide. We'll do these questions just really quick, guys, and then we won't do the last ones, okay? I just wanna, I always, I always get a late start. I don't know why I think I'm surprised by that. Okay, what is the biggest difference between eukaryotic cells and bacterial cells? We have, and I have redone these hopefully. All right, okay, Lorian. <laughs> yeah, okay, Charlie. Anybody from Charlie can help her. Exactly. So that's exactly the difference. Just as simple as that, whether it has a nucleus or not. All right. All right. Name one way that eukaryotic flagella differ from bacterial flagella. Basic concepts here. Michaela, D. Yep. That's one way. Yep. That's a good example. Also remember they all move like whip-like instead of the rotating. That's another good one. Okay, what is the eukaryotic nucleus for? What is it used for? This is general concepts. Krista H. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going. You're okay. Okay. Um, anybody else in Bravo want to try this one? Yeah, so protecting, you could say that that way, protecting the genes that are inside. Um, the general concepts that we're getting at with the nucleus, and, um, and so this is where I like to tell people try not to overthink these things. It's just whole, containing the DNA. That's it. Okay. That's its major function. All right, what is the function of the endoplasmic reticulum or ER? Let me see, this is Brittany T. Brittany here. She said she wasn't going to be here today, honestly, now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> Tori. I think she hasn't been here for a little bit, right? Because Tori, she's missed a few days, I think. Yeah. I did update it, I promise. It's... Okay. Uh, Becky. Uh, what, in the it has ribosomes. It, well, it's the. Is it, it doesn't store the ribosomes. It's just a minute to the So, um, so 
you're really thinking along the right lines here. And honestly, if you'd have just said that it has ribosomes, I probably would have been happy with just that. But yes, so it is studied with ribosomes. And the ribosomes just chill there. Think of them as like the machines that are on the machine floor of the rough ER. So they're the ones doing the work. And the, that's otherwise the ER is just like the structure where all this is happening. So the ribosomes really aren't going to go anywhere, but the products that they make, which are the proteins, will be going places. So that that you could see it as rough ER. That's where ribosomes are doing their work, and the work they're making is making proteins. Making proteins is a good one to look at there. All right, that was a good answer though. Uh, mitochondria. Wow, this is an easier one. Uh, cadence. <laughs> just general concept of what the mitochondria will do for the cell. Uh, you're fine. Um, anybody from Alpha want to answer? Nobody know? All right, let's see. Uh, anybody know the answer? Or raise your hand. Okay, so I saw your hand first. What's your name? Okay. Yeah, so that's where all the energy is going to be made in the cell. That's all it is, is the energy powerhouse. All right, that's it. You guys are done with those questions. Oh, Rachel, what was your team? What team are you from? Delta. Delta. Okay. I want to be sure that you guys get this Okay, so let's move on and try to push through this. I'm sure so I don't keep talking about nothing again. So fungi, I'm going to tell you what I want you guys to know about the fungi. Things that fall into fungi category, yeast and mold. Yes, I also am aware that mushrooms fall into this, but we're not talking about that in this class, okay? So yeasts and mold. Yes, yeasts fall into fungi, therefore yeasts fall into eukaryotes, okay? Um, when you have a mold, let's say I have a piece of bread. And it's growing mold on it. And you know how it looks all fuzzy and it's got like almost like hair like little fuzziness or whatever on it? Those, if you zoom in and look at just the hairs, each little hair, those are called hyphae. Okay, so each little hair of your furry mold is called a hyphae. Some of the stuff we're going to just push over because I'm not going to ask you about it and it's not on your thing. Um, where do fungi get their nutrients from? They can eat normal stuff like we do. We're also called heterotrophs. That's not so important to remember that term right now but they can be saprobes, which means breaking down dead things. And they can be parasites, which means they're feeding off of living things harmfully. Okay, so we have the hyphae as our, our little hairs that are growing off, but our overall big picture, if you look at a whole mold, like if it's all fuzzy on your um, strawberry or on your bread or whatever it is, that overall structure is called the mycelium. Okay, That's really all you need from this. Oh, and they are gonna make spores this is why I put endospores up on the floor so we can know the difference, okay? They make spores to reproduce. We're going to talk about how that works. They are not the same thing as bacterial endospores. So obviously mold can just break off and like make another piece of mold over here, or it can just keep spreading out from where it is. But if it wants to go beyond that, it can go through asexual or sexual reproduction. We're not talking about sexual. I don't want to get into it. So let's talk about the asexual. That's the spores. They make these structures called sporangiospores or conidiospores that produce sporangiospores or conidiospores. I will never make you discern between the two words, okay? So my big idea is that you guys know the difference between sporangio versus conidio when you see these terms. Sporangio covered, conidio open out in the air. I don't have a good way for remembering it. Endospores are for bacteria, spores, just general spores, and they'll always be put in the context of fungal. I'm not going to write on the text. Spores are they bacteria or whatever? I'm not going to do that for you, I promise. But it'll always be associated with fungal. fungal. But this is for reproduction. You see how this is basically quite the opposite of what's going on. These guys are hunkering down. They couldn't reproduce because there's not enough nutrients. So they're going to hunker down until nutrients come about. They pop back out and they go back into vegetative form to start reproducing. 
producing you guys. Like you're reproducing, things are good. So it's a good time. And then these guys over here, you're dormant. This is rough times. Okay, so don't get them confused. They are not related to one another. They are terms that scientists did this to you, okay? It wasn't me. Um, but yeah, I just have to teach it to you now. Uh, all right, so you can either be enclosed or you can be open like, like a dandelion, like, like if it was a dandelion and they're not the same thing, obviously, but really starts forced kind of freely out into the wild um, or they can burst out from the covering. Those are the differences between these guys. Don't care about sexual. Obviously, you can use these structures and look at them microscopically to help identify what species you're dealing with if you need to do that um, without your DNA or something. Um, these guys can be associated with illness, and we know this. Uh, fungal infections like athlete's foot, for example, that's an infection. You can also get some of these fungi um, infections like that shouldn't be causing infections, like aspergillus is a normal type of fungus that is in the atmosphere, but um, some people can get infections from it. It could be like uh, lung infections, it could even be meningitis, or it could be um, like sinus infections, which is a pretty common one if you are allergic to mold. Because if you're allergic to mold, you're already having inflammation in your sinus cavities, and then um, that makes you more susceptible to that mold that's already there to want to kind of take over and do its own thing. So some people can get um, sinus infections that are quite severe associated with allergies to mold. Most of the time though, most other uh, fungi, fungal situations that cause disease uh, will be when you have uh, like a lowered immune system is what I'm trying to say. So opportunistic. So they're taking advantage of the fact that your immune system is lowered, very commonly seen with HIV. Uh, we already know fungi are used for food and things like that. And when I'm saying fungi for food, yeah, okay, we used fungi to make penicillin, right? But we also have, uh, and you can think about cheese, you can think about using the yeast to make your beer or your wine and all this sort of stuff. So pretty widely used. All right, moving on to the protists. This is kingdom protista. So this includes two subkingdoms, subkingdom algae and subkingdom protozoa. These are all gonna be technically single cellular organisms, but they may work together in colonies in the sense that like algae might do. So algae, and this includes kelp, sea kelp. They are not plants. They actually fall into the algae category and they're like technically colonies of um, single celled organisms that are working together well enough that they can form kelp or whatever, which is interesting to think about. I don't understand enough about it, but the algae are responsible, especially in the form of the plankton, the plankton algae, um, responsible for most of the oxygen on earth. So 70% of it. So they're important, but that's about all I'm gonna tell you about them. Next, we're gonna go to the protozoa. These guys can be all over and be perfectly harmless, but they also can be parasitic. They also are single cellular organisms, but they have uh, developed in a way that they can have structures that are quite similar to mouse and stuff in that single cell organism. They can also have something that looks like legs to help them get around, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, they can be free living or they can be uh, parasitic and they can get around by these three mechanisms or they can be non-modal. There's four types of protozoa. The pseudopod using ones, those are the fake feet. So we didn't talk about those earlier because it's not a true appendage, right? It's just using the cell body, pushing it out, sticking onto something and then pulling yourself along. That sounds familiar. Yeah, amoebas do that. So they're kind of just and then pushing along. They can always use their little pseudopod, their fake feet to eat things up as well. So flagella, we learned about that. And cilia, we learned about that. Then the guys that don't move. So those are four groups. Uh, there's some pictures of them, cool. So these guys also have a thing that applies to this up here. So I want to put up here that these guys will, if things are good. Oh my God. That will be vegetative. Because the protozoa have protozoans and cysts. So cysts. Protozoa. 
This is our protozoa. These are our hardy, dormant, um, resistant guys. This is when times are rough. When things are good for them, they're good equals protozoa. So you can see here, bacterial vegetative cells and protozoal trophozoites are similar, analogous. Okay, and then the protozoa cysts in the bacterial endospores are analogous. But these guys are completely separate. The chromophores. Okay. That's why one kind of draws up so we can prove that these are power related and not related. But so the cysts, you can imagine they're going to insist and become protected and whatever. Trophozoite, where I remember that that's the active form, is because troph, think of trough. Like pigs eat out of a trough. If you're eating, are you dormant? No. So you gotta be active. <laughs> so that's how I remember those. Okay. Usually the cysts are involved in the spreading of the disease. I'm not going to talk too much about the structure of these guys, um, but they, they would fall into the realm of parasitology. Parasitology is the field that studies protozoa and parasitic helminths. So both of those. So yeah, parasite is anything. We generally would use it to talk about protozoa and um, helminths, but it is also a term that can apply to anything that's causing harm to a host. So these guys, you do know them. You just didn't know that you know these guys. This is brain-eating amoebas fall into this. Giardia, Trichomonas vaginalis, sexually transmitted disease is extremely common. Um, uh, causes vaginitis, just like yeast infections do. Let's see, we've got plasmodium species. The plasmodium species cause malaria. Toxoplasma species that cause toxoplasmosis. That's the disease you get from handling kitty litter if you're pregnant. It can actually be very severe. I don't want to downplay that disease. Anybody? Uh, it's like abortive. So please don't take it like lightly. So yeah, so these guys do cause disease and there's more. Let's just jump into the helmets. Gosh, I know we're over. So let me go through these guys really quick. These guys have little terms that we do have to know. This is maybe the thing that I want you guys to take home with it, which will simply be the helmets is the overall thing. If you are the flatworms, then you are platy helminthes. I got so caught up in talking about nucleus and Smithsonian. All right, uh, and then those are the flatworms. In the flatworms, we have the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, and the trematodes, which are the flukes. And then the roundworms, they are called nematodes. So do know these terms and be able to associate them with what type of helminth they are. They do have true like reproductive tracts and they are multicellular. These are animals, actually animals. They fall into the kingdom animalia. Um, they have crazy life cycles. The definitive host for these guys is the one where they have reproduction occurring. They can enter through uh, usually oral route or through intact skin. Let me say that again. They can end, enter through your oral route, which can, we can imagine that's gonna be like fecal oral and stuff like that. Also through your intact skin. It's not going to be like you look down and there's a giant worm burrowing into you. It's going to be like there's a microscopic larvae version burrowing into you. And um, you go swimming in contaminated water that you didn't know was contaminated in, and you end up with a little rash on you, and you might have schistosomiasis now because it, you got in through your skin. Um, it also more commonly through your feet. Like we talk about um, hookworms or whipworms, they get in through your feet when you're walking on contaminated soil or something. So uh, most of this stuff doesn't exist in the U.S. Most of it's in third world countries, and that's why you haven't heard of it, because in general, the U.S. doesn't care about third world countries. Tell me I'm wrong. So, um, yeah, and you can classify them based on their structures and all of this. And like I said, most of these are going to be associated with third world countries. We do have helminth infections here in the U.S. Um, this would include pinworms. Uh, this is the most common one I can think of for humans. Pinworms being the ones that, like, if you know, 
you know, guys, but it's like little kids when they get the itchy booty and you put the tape on a uh, booty hole and you take it off. And if there's little worms there, they have skin worms. You can literally buy medication for it over the counter. Um, so that's how common it is. It's just people aren't aware of it, usually, especially if they don't have kids. Um, but yeah, if you have kids that play outside a lot, then you probably have <laughs> experienced this. So, and of course, this is a lot more prevalent in pets. Um, dogs have to be dewormed, not just for heartworm, but for other things as well. So I, I told you guys about meatball and spaghetti, yeah? Uh, my dogs, I have two dogs that I adopted back in January, or yeah, January, meatball and spaghetti, and they had heartworms, and they had to be treated for it and everything. And that's fine. That's their story about their heartworms. But guys, meatball is so chonky. He's so, I don't know how, because I'm not feeding him, I'm feeding, feeding him less than I'm feeding to spaghetti. And spaghetti is a much smaller guy. But here's what meatball does. You let him outside for five minutes and he has eaten every bug in the freaking neighborhood, I swear to God. And like one day I came out there, he's like chihuahua mix, but he's not chihuahua size, he's like Jack Russell Terrier size, basically. And so I come outside one time and um, I see him out in the grass. I'm like, meatball, what are you doing? And I just hear, like the cicadas do, right? I'm like, meatball, and he turns and he's got the cicada in his little mouth. And he's just like, and I'm like, meatball, no, drop it. And he's like, we're like trying to get it down as fast as he could and it was buzzing the whole time and like the, the like wings and stuff oh my god meatball he, his name suits him man i don't know he's a meatball for sure but yeah and then we wonder where the dogs would get the worms from <laughs> all right that's it let's go up to the lab yeah, we do have more questions on here but i don't want to waste the time with them